be talking about the resurgence of hula hooping. It used to be a fad, but now it's much more of a, a dance and uh, actually a spiritual practice. So, uh, and I love hula hooping. Uh, no one really knows when uh, or where hula hooping began, but they do know that in 1958, Waymo sold uh, 100 million hula hoops around the world, and it became an international phenomenon. However, the hoops were too small and too lightweight for uh, adults. Uh, they're really meant for proportions of, of children, so it kind of faded away after that. Uh, and then in the mid-90s, there's a, a band called uh, The String Cheese Incident, and they would actually um, toss adult-sized hoops into the crowd in order to get them to dance. Um, and it worked, and uh, people started dancing, and it started taking all over the, uh, the country to different um, music festivals, including by Anna Reichenbach, who became actually the first professional hoop dancer. Uh, Anna uh, would perform underneath the name of Hoopalicious, and she would uh, uh, actually make uh, hoops and sell them. So she kind of seeded the modern uh, hoop dance movement. To make a hoop, you basically need uh, irrigation tubing. Uh, you cut the tubes, uh, you have to um, heat the ends of the, the tubes with a connector, and then you wrap it in tape. Uh, and so uh, it, that helps it give you a little bit more friction and stay on your body. Now most people, when they start to hoop, they want to sort of go around in a circle, and that's not what you want to do. What you want to do is kind of just go back and forth. And so you have two, two points of contact that will uh, make it a lot easier and actually let well, you do a lot more complicated moves now. Uh, most people don't know that uh, hooping, uh, most of the moves are with the hands, uh, and then with the waist, and then uh, on the legs. And, the, uh, and there's other places as well, but there's a lot of sorts of variations that you can do. You can move around, you can you know, dance, you can wear a blindfold, and a lot of people, some people do uh, fire hoops. But the thing that you want to do is to be also be able to switch directions. Like, what are you doing? You switch to both sides, so that can give you a little bit of a balance. There's a lot of different training resources that are out there. Um, I'll sort of walk you through all the different uh, hoop moves, um, books and DVDs. And so there's a whole repertory of moves that you can use, and this is really a, the performance context of hoop dance. Um, there's hoop camps where people from all over the world come together to learn different tips and tricks and workshops and share insights with each other. Uh, and uh, it's really a chance to get re-inspired if it's possible. And the uh, ratio is about 9 women for everyone. Man. Now, one male is uh, uh, Rich Porter, and what he does is a lot of isopops. Uh, and diagramic motion in the air. Um, and so that's kind of like off-body hooping is the characteristic of uh, the male hooping style. Uh, another person is uh, Baxter. He does uh, blindfolded hooping, uh, which is really focusing on their inner experience rather than what's happening outside of you. He started the hoop path, which is uh, it's kind of like a meditative branch of hooping. So hooping is a feedback of rhythm. You're listening to the music, you're expressing your rhythm through your body, and then the hoop is feeding that rhythm back into you. So it creates this closed loop of rhythm uh, that's really profound and it's really deep and engaging. Um, and there's also mini hoops that go a lot faster. And so when you do the mini hoops, you can actually hoop to the beat of the rhythm of the music. Um, you can use a metronome to actually get the technical details of that, but it kind of puts you into this meditative state of mind. And when they look at uh, brains of meditators, what they found is that it, it has a synchronization between the left and right side of the brain, and uh, it's this brain coherence. And when you're hooping, it's actually physically stimulating both sides of your body. So it helps create this brain coherence, which leads to flow. Flow is sort of like this, you're totally in the moment, uh, you're, uh, you're not thinking about anything else, and you're just um, effortlessly moving from move to move. And that's kind of like the ultimate goal for any hooper is to achieve this state of flow. And the spin, uh, sustained spinning, is something that uh, the whirling dervishes have known for a long time. Uh, but to do this really gets you into this state of spiritual bliss really fast. Uh, so sustained spinning is a really uh, powerful thing to do. And everyone you talk to who does hooping has some sort of story of transformation, whether it's been losing weight or helping heal from cancer, it just makes them uh, feel better about their moods. Uh, but it's a transformative practice and also a spiritual practice as well. So what makes up a spiritual practice? Well, the Institute of Noetic Sciences has four basic categories. It's uh, our criteria. It's to set your attention out to do something in the world. It's paying attention to your inner experience. It's doing something that's repetitive that you can practice every day. And it's having either inner guidance or guidance from the community. So I definitely think that uh, hooping is something that qualifies as a spiritual practice. It's also a whole hell of a lot of fun. Uh, so I just hope maybe you can get aspired to do a little bit of hoop dance and uh, yeah, thanks.